In September of 2003, I was involved in a conversation with a colleague here at Clarkston campus of Georgia Perimeter College. And the other party commented, we were talking about, first of all, the tremendous diversity at the, at the Clarkston campus of Georgia Perimeter College. And my colleague said, instead of just talking about it, why don't we do something about it? Why can't we do something to celebrate the diversity that we have here at the Clarkston campus? With that initial question, the idea of forum was born. The proposal was drawn up and presented to the Student Government Association, and they approved it unanimously. They agreed to sponsor this important event. Six months of enormous planning have led us to the point that we are today. Dictionaries define forum as a public meeting place for open discussion. What better way to approach the concept of diversity than at a forum? Georgia Perimeter College is currently the largest two-year college in the state of Georgia. The Clarkston campus has experienced immense growth both in domestic as well as international enrollments. International students here on the Clarkston campus currently represent 144 different countries. But this is only a reflection of the community that we call home. In the city of Clarkston, one of every three residents was not born in the United States. Consequently, consequently, this is only a reflection of the county where our college is located. DeKalb County has seen a 300% increase in the refugee immigrant population in the past three years. With these statistics come a sad truth. Unfortunately, the treasure all around us is often taken for granted. The wealth of diversity that is Clarkston campus often seems insignificant in the global community that we call metropolitan Atlanta. It is not until conflict arises that we seriously consider the impact of diversity. It is then viewed as a detriment instead of the asset that it truly is. To fully function in a global community, we must be aware of all that our own community has to offer. An education obtained here at GPC, and especially at the Clarkston campus, comes complete with experiences based in diversity, experiences to prepare students to be interactive members of this community, this county, this state, this country, and this world. We live in a world of differences, different races, different ages, different religions, different cultures, different sexual orientations, and different abilities. These differences, whether or not obvious, do not intimidate, frighten, or cause concern until we succumb to the learned behavior of intolerance. Children do not innately discriminate. They must learn to hate. Then as adults, we spend the rest of our lives adapting to change as we learn to be more tolerant. Some of us acquire this quality while others do not. It is only through tolerance that we gain the knowledge to understand the differences of others. Without understanding, we can never fully experience all that life has to offer. Without acceptance, we deny ourselves the treasure found in the world of diversity that surrounds us. I welcome you to Georgia Perimeter College, and I welcome you to Forum 2004. Good morning. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Mr. Morris Dees. Mr. Morris Dees is a Southerner. He was born in Shorter, Alabama, the son of a farming family that eventually owned their own farm. He saw firsthand the respect and openness to blacks in his family, not common at the time. More common was injustice and prejudice. He's best known for developing a legal strategy of attacking the leadership of racist organizations at their financial heart and holding them accountable for the violent consequences of their activities. He's a graduate of the University of Alabama Law School. He's a successful businessman who came to a pinnacle point in his life and chose to pursue civil rights law. After law, after law school, he started a law firm in Montgomery with Millard Fuller. Millard Fuller later became the founder of Habitat for Humanity. He did law practice. He did some cases for the ACLU. In uh, 1967, he stopped the expansion of, of Auburn University into an Alabama city that already had a black college. 1968, he filed suit uh, for the integration of all the YMCAs in Montgomery. But most Famously, he is known for his suits against hate groups, 
These included um, awards for $6.3 million against the Aryan Nation and um, other groups. He's also remembered as the creator of the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, uh, created by the artist Maya Lin. He's the author of several books, A Season for Justice, Hate on Trial, Gathering Storm. He was the subject of a made-for-television movie, Line of Fire, based on his life. Uh, he hosted a documentary in 2000 on HBO entitled uh, Hate.com. He's a recipient of a number of awards, and these awards talk a little bit about his growth and commitment to uh, principles throughout his life. As a, growing up in a farming family, uh, he was awarded in 1955 the Star Farmer Award uh, by the future farmers of uh, Alabama. Uh, he was named one of ten outstanding young men in American by the JCs. The American Bar Association award, awarded him with the Young Lawyers Distinguished Service Award. The American Civil Liberties Union recognized him with the Richard Baldwin Award. The group, um, the Trial Lawyers for Public Justice, named him uh, the Trial Lawyer of the Year in 1987. He was given awards by the National Education Association and uh, was given a humanitarian award by his alma mater at the University of Alabama. He has more than 25 honorary degrees. If you look at the progression of his life, he was a son, a husband, a Sunday school teacher, a father, a grandfather. He was a farmer, a student, a businessman, a lawyer, a and a humanitarian. We're delighted today to welcome Morris Dees. Thank you for having me here and making me one of the crowns in the color box. I appreciate that very much. And I noticed one thing about those crowns, though, they were all side by side. And we have an audience here where people are scattered so far I can hardly see everybody. So I'm going to ask you to do something unusual. Uh, the fact that we don't have this auditorium full doesn't bother me because, as my grandmother said once, it doesn't take much yeast to make the bread rise. And sometimes, a few people can do a lot. So I want to ask everybody to come and fill these rows up right down here so we can all talk together because we're going to have a conversation this morning. And it's going to be hard to do it when you're sitting so far I can't even see you. Just come right down here in the front. They had a small auditorium planned for this thing and they decided to have a bigger one and there may be some classes coming in later. But everybody, if everybody sat down here, I think we'd feel together more. I'll give you a little time to, there you go. I do thank you. I grew up in a little Southern Baptist church and everybody always sat in the back, I think, so they could get out. So the preacher came up with the idea to have one row of seats in the front. And as soon as that was filled up, the weight of everybody in that seat caused another one to pop up behind it. I think he patented this thing. <clears throat> thank you very much for the kind remarks in your introduction. The things that you said about me were not things I accomplished all alone. We have presently 120 people that work at the Southern Poverty Law Center. They come from all over the nation, many from this state, writers, educators, investigators, lawyers, teachers, and others that make our various projects, including our Teaching Tolerance Project, work. And also, without the support of over 250,000 people around this nation who support us with their contributions, we also could not do our work. The judgments that you heard announced, we take no part of any recovery we get. We give it all to our clients and we pay all the expenses. Also, we don't get any government and rarely get a foundation grant. So we have also a community, a community of over 250,000 people who work together for the things that we believe in. You know, now, a lot of lots going on in our world today. We glued to the television, trying to see what's happening in Afghanistan or Iraq or other parts of the world. We see trains blown up in Spain. Elections we're involved in the United States today, where we tend to <clears throat> divide each other along various lines. But I do love this nation. This nation from time to time, has always had 
crises. But this nation is also changing. And I hope that at the end of our program this morning that you will be prouder to be an American. And someday, for you students here, America will also be proud of you. As we look into our lives and, and see where, how we got where we are, and clearly I cannot relate to most of the students at this college because we come from all over the, the world, 144 countries. I've only visited a very few. But I think we do hold some things in common, no matter what religion or lack of religion we might have or what government we come from. I think in most of our cultures, we believe in justice and fairness. I remember a teacher that I had at a little country school between here and Montgomery, and there was only about 50 or 60 of us in that school. And this teacher, Mrs. Virabel Johnson, had a lot of things to tell us of interest. She wanted us to grow up to be good boys and girls and to make something of our lives. And I remember every morning she took us out in front of that little school. We put our hands on our hearts as they raised the flag and we pledged allegiance. And I remember so well the words that have stuck with me and that have guided my life ever since. One nation with liberty and justice for all. But as we think about this nation today, we find that our country is deeply divided. There's a battle going on over whose America is this? In whose version of America is going to prevail? And the students at this school are going to be a part of that debate. You'll either do nothing and let others set the agenda, or you'll participate yourselves and help this nation become even greater than it is today. And there are definitely differences. We have those in this country who would like to spend billions of dollars to put a space station on Mars, and yet are unable to bring the price of prescription drugs down so the average person can afford them. We have those in this nation who will spend $200 billion in Iraq, much of it going to rebuild the infrastructure of the cities like Baghdad, rebuilding their sewage system, their water system, and yet Atlanta, Georgia cannot afford the $1 billion estimated that it will take to rebuild the sewer and water system of this city that's sprawling all over central Georgia. And that can be said of New Jersey, any city there, Philadelphia, Chicago, and other towns. There's a division over whose America this is and whose version of America is going to prevail. And also, we're in other countries in the world trying to get our ideas of democracy across to people where those ideas are not common or familiar. And if we're going to be successful in this battle over whose nation this is, it'll be because we resort to the very core values in this nation of fairness and justice. Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of President Roosevelt, I think put it best. She said, human rights begin close to home, in our schools, in our communities, and in our workplaces. And it's in these places that people seek equal justice. And if they can't find them in these places, then we'll look in vain for progress in a larger world. America is changing. By the year 2050, people like myself and some of you here will be in a minority. Some people see that as a bad thing. This campus clearly reflects what this nation will look like many years to come. Some states already reflect what America looks like many years to come. 
And if we're to remain a participatory democracy where the majority rules, then we're going to have to make sure that all the people among us have an equal opportunity and that we take care of the least among us. You may study all types of subjects here, math, English, political science, computer technology, education, you name it. Those are important things to help you make a living. But if you want your life to have real value, then you have to have the lesson that this program is all about. Diversity, tolerance, and acceptance. Because in the end, that'll be the deciding factor as to what kind of nation we are. I didn't really realize the changing face of America because I grew up on a small cotton farm not far from here. Until I was involved in a lawsuit in the early 80s, that thing brought it home to me. I represented a group of Vietnamese fishermen down in Galveston Bay, Texas. That's some 50,000 Vietnamese refugees from the war in Vietnam who had come to this country. Had they stayed behind after that war, many would have been killed because they fought on our side. They were settled all over the nation, but the Catholic Relief Services settled about 50,000 of them down in the Galveston Bay, Texas area near Houston. And most of these people came to this country literally with the clothes on their backs. But when they got here, they were hardworking. They took over numerous businesses, car washes, restaurants, and other things, and were very successful quickly. But about 50 of these people decided that they wanted to get in the fishing business, shrimping business, like they had done back in the warm waters of Saigon Harbor and other harbors around Vietnam. They had no money to buy fancy boats, and so they bought old broken down boats, many derelict boats American fishermen had abandoned. They fixed these old boats up and went out to fish. These 50 fishermen had to compete with 1,200 American fishing boats plying the waters up and down the Galveston Bay area. But they were also industrious and hardworking. They got up early in the morning and came in late at night. And it wasn't long before their success caused jealousy among the American fishermen. And the American fishermen had an association, so they went to the Texas legislature and said, stop issuing licenses to these immigrants. And the Texas legislature said, we can't do that. This is the American free enterprise system. If they outfish you, then they win. Well, that didn't sit well with a group of American fishermen who were riding around in $250,000 boats and coming in at 3 o'clock for Miller break. And so they decided that they would call on the Ku Klux Klan to scare these fishermen away. The Klan arrived, and they burned several big crosses down near the harbor, and late at night a couple of boats mysteriously burned, and the Vietnamese became very frightened. They put their 50 boats up for sale because they remembered the Khmer Rouge in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and the terrorists that terror that these people cause, and they thought the Klan was kind of like, well, maybe it represented the American people. Well, I got a call from a lawyer representing these people in legal business matters, and he, he said, could you and your lawyers at the Southern Poverty Law Center come down and help us with this situation? We hate to see these people sell their boats and have to leave. Well, I went down and I met with the FBI and the local law enforcement, and they're very helpful. Didn't have enough of criminal indictments, but they gave us what they had, and we met with the Vietnamese fishermen and convinced them to file a lawsuit in federal court. For you non-lawyers, we sought an injunction. That meant that we were asking the court to enjoin or these Klansmen and American fishermen from interfering with these people. And if they violate that court order, if we got it, then they'd be guilty of criminal contempt of court, and they would have to go to prison. Well, we got a quick hearing because shrimping season opened only two weeks away by the time we filed this lawsuit to seek this preliminary injunction. The federal judge gave us enormous leeway. We took testimony night and day, and we were ready for that emergency hearing. 
And on Friday, before we used to go to court on Monday morning, Nguyen Van Nam, the leader of the little Vietnamese fishing group, called me up and said, Mr. Dees, drop the lawsuit. I said, oh, Nam, no, we can't drop this lawsuit. We can win it. He says, no, I've been told by the leaders and other businesses in this Houston area, Vietnamese people, that they're afraid. They want to appease the Klan and just let them have the fishing. And I said, no, you can't do that. You don't drop the lawsuit. We're going to win it. I said, could you give me an opportunity to speak to these Vietnamese fishermen? Well, later that Friday evening, I was standing in front of a group of Vietnamese fishermen in a Catholic church with a priest interpreting. These 50 people were there, many dressed in the clothes they came to this country in, sitting behind them, filling the pews with their families. I said, you know, folks, America has laws designed to protect the minority, people like you. That's what makes this country great. And if we get an injunction, it'll protect you. If you drop this lawsuit and cut and run now, they'll come after you other businesses for sure. I said, you know, that was a man named Martin Luther King. His people had their churches bombed and people shot seeking their rights, and had they not pursued their rights in court like you're doing, they wouldn't have gotten them nearly as soon as they did. Please, please, don't drop your lawsuit. Well, they gave it some serious consideration. It must have been quite a debate. And later that evening, I got a call. New in Van Nam said, Mr. Dees, continue your lawsuit. Well, we put on a good case in court. We had some very brave American fishermen come forward to testify that they didn't really like what was happening and testified that they'd been intimidated if they allowed Vietnamese fishermen to continue parking their boats at their piers. Well, we won a good victory. We got a very strong court order directed at about 50 named individuals, Vietnamese fishermen and American fishermen, and not Vietnamese, but American fishermen and Klansmen to not harass these people. That was a big celebration in the Vietnamese community that night. Went to a big party at a restaurant, and the leader of the Vietnamese fishermen said, would you come down to the blessing of the fleet? on Monday morning. I said, I'll be glad to. I got there about five in the morning. The sun was still, still hadn't come up. Fog was hanging heavy over the bay. Catholic priest standing at the dock in Kemer, Texas, where Clear Creek Channel comes out into the bay. Families of these fishermen were lying in the docks. We couldn't see any boats, but we heard a diesel engine chugging. And after a while, the boat popped out through the fog and came out into the bay, was blessed by the priest, another and another, until finally some 15 or 20 boats had gone out into the bay to fish. Sun began to burn through the fog, and I looked to my right and looked to my left, and I could see the sun glistening off the badges of the United States Marshals that had been sent there to protect these people. And also, I could see in the faces of these families an enormous pride. I not only was proud to be a lawyer that day, but I was proud to be an American, seeing the majesty of our legal system working, helping these new Americans find a place at America's table and not just find a place at our table as some type guest, but to help us build that table for the future. And you know, it kind of opened my eyes. I know we have the Statue of Liberty with the slogan across the bottom that we welcome people from all the nations to this country. And there are probably few Native Americans in this room. If they are, you're the only original 
people that we know of that inhabited this country. So all of, the, all of us in this country came from somewhere else as immigrants, so to speak. Some came on ships of their own choice. Some came on ships not of their choice. But together, we've made this nation work. And this school that you attend here is a perfect example of continuing that great experiment that we have in this nation. And their problems, sure. Everybody doesn't get along with everybody else. Whether it's along racial lines, lines of sexual orientation, age, whether somebody's handicapped or not, there's so many divides that separate us in this country. But there surely is more that brings us together in our nation. As I said to start with, before you last group of students came in, we have a lot to be proud of in this country. To bring you up to date a bit, I talked about how this nation, though, is changing. Even though there's some wonderful things to be proud of in this nation, today we have 751 hate groups operating. Some Klan groups left, small, neo-Nazi groups, skinhead groups, some groups called neo-Confederates, some academics even, we call it academic racism, who are teaching that the Holocaust didn't exist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that some people among us are not as natively intelligent as other people. You have all kinds of things that are set about to divide us in this country. We have 450 hate websites on the Internet, one click away from the smallest child. You can check our website, SP, splcenter.org, and you can find a link that will take you to some of those if you want to see some very disgusting things that are being sent over the airwaves today in this country. We all know about serious hate crimes. We know about James Byrd being drugged behind his death down in Texas by a truck driven by a couple of Klan types. Or Matthew Shepard, a student at the University of Wyoming, taken out in the desert, tied to a fence, beaten, and left to die simply because of his sexual orientation. We know about those, and those are horrible hate crimes. But there's some 50,000 additional hate crimes committed every year, not by members of hate groups. No, actually by our neighbors against each other because we disagree about items and things that in the scheme of the long run, are really rather meaningless. And I'm sure this campus has, has its share of, of conflicts over differences. Few campuses certainly are free of that. And you know, but I think the thing that we need to talk about here today that really makes a difference is what I I'd like to call access. Who gets to go through this door or that door and who doesn't? Who gets this job or that job, and who doesn't? Who is accepted in a community, and who is rejected? I guess what I'm talking about is built-in bias, systemic bias. That's the real issue. It was so easy back when Rosa Parks got on that bus, not easy what she did, but it was easy to see that the back of the bus that transit bus for public transportation was black and the front was white. And we could see the problem very easily. But today, the back of the economic bus is black in so many places in our nation, and the front is not. But it's not so clear for us to see the difference because of systemic built-in bias and prejudice. To prove this recently, the University of Chicago did an experiment working with New York University. They got job applications from the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and other newspapers. And they prepared job applications to send to the people looking for skilled, professional type employees in different fields. These were people that were really looking to employ qualified workers, so the applications were made the best you could write them, the best education, the best experience, 
etc. The only problem was all the job applications were exactly alike. But on half of them, they put an African-American sounding name, Lakeisha Washington. And on the other half, they put an, Af uh, an Anglo sounding name, like Emily Brandon. And I'm sure they could have put a Latino name or other names, and it would have had the same results. But in the end, the Lakeisha's got 50% fewer callbacks. Judged solely by the perceived color of their skin and by the perceived ability they might have to do the job. Nobody interviewed them. Nobody called them. They just didn't call them. Lack of access. Not long ago, a couple of handsome young men, one African-American, one white, Anglo-American, students at Harvard University left on an experiment of a similar nature. They went around the country going in stores shopping for watches. The two or three hundred dollar types that usually are kept under a counter. Black guy goes in typically, no matter what city it was, it's pretty typical. He'd go in and ask to see a watch and it would deliver on the counter, laid up on it for him to look at. And then he would ask to see another one. They'd put that one back in the counter and put another one on the counter. And when he got ready to purchase the watch, he walks up to the counter with his credit card and almost invariably he was asked for another form of identification. White guy comes in 30 minutes later, same clerk, asked to look at a watch. They put one up, put two up, put five up, fill on the counters, covered with watches, and the clerk's off waiting on somebody else over in the corner. Doesn't even pay attention. This guy leaves with a watch, and he is asked for only his credit card. Systemic, built-in bias and discrimination. And that same built-in bias and discrimination exists in many other areas, based on sometimes a person's skin color, based on their sexual orientation, based on their religion, sometimes where they're, what they physically look like. This is the cancer that you have to eradicate in our nation in order to get this country back healthy again. Because by the year 2050, as I said, a majority of the people won't be like me. They'll be more like the people that go to this campus and this university. Because of uh, some of the tensions and hate crimes in our nation, we at the Southern Poverty Law Center and, and its various projects, the Intelligence Project and our Teaching Tolerance Project, began to look around this country to see what really is happening. What are people thinking? And I'll have to tell you, we found good news. People universally said about people who commit bad hate crimes, we're not a part of that. We don't approve of that. And we found groups all over the country, small and large, where people were getting together to reach out to the victims of people who were victims of intolerance and hatred. They're saying, we want to be a part of you. We feel your pain, and we want you to be a part of us. And as we looked around the country, we found so many stories real life stories of people helping other people, very touching stories. I remember one in particular in, uh, out of Billings, Montana. There, a small boy, Jewish, and there weren't many Jewish people who lived in that community, weren't many minorities. This little boy was given a, the candle holder to use for Hanukkah, a Jewish ceremony. And each night of Hanukkah, one candle is lit, and this little boy was so proud of his menorah candle holder that he put it in the window so people could see it from the street, and each night he'd light a candle. And somebody saw it who didn't like it, and they threw a brick through the window. The little boy was very sad, story in the newspaper about it. And a businessman read that story, and it bothered him. He took the letters down off of the marquee that sold his products and in their place had written, not in our town. 
And he organized the police, the newspaper, the schools, and they created cardboard menorahs and placed one in the window of every house facing the streets in Billings, Montana, in support of that little victim of that hate crime. And after this campaign was underway, this mother, father took the little boy out to see. They drove down one street and up another, and he could see these menorahs backlit from the house lights inside. And he turned to his mom and said, Mom, I didn't know so many Jewish people lived in Billings. <laughs> and she said, No, son, they're our friends. And therein, I think, lies the answer. When we build bridges across these divides that separate us, they'll be built from acceptance, love, and friendship. And I'm not talking about that kind of love and friendship we have for our family members. That's very important. But if you're like me, I've got some family members I love in spite of them. In fact, I had an old uncle that ran a country store at the crossroads, and he kept a Klan robe in the back of his store. Fortunately, he changed his views before he passed away. But even knowing that, I still liked and loved my uncle because I understood him. We understand family members. We understand what they do. He thought it was just something smart to do. But I tell you, a lot of times I saw him deliver baskets of food to people's homes who had a tragedy, a fire. It didn't matter what color they were. He just had a blind spot, though, when the, he was supposed to create some kind of public impression. As I said, I'm glad he changed. But I'm, no, I'm talking about that kind of acceptance and love and appreciation of people who are different than we are, who have these different characteristics that divide us in this nation that I've talked about. Appreciating and understanding people who are different and understanding what each of us brings to the table and how important it is to reach across those divides, not just in name only, but to learn people, to learn all about them, learn what's in their heart, learn what's in their families. Sit at the table with them, have them sit at your table. Visit their mosques, their churches, their synagogues, wherever they might worship, or if they don't believe in any God at all, talk to them about their beliefs, whatever. That's what we need in this country. But you know, there have, been, there have been dark days before in America, and I'm not saying this is the darkest day we have right now, even though I do think we're facing a serious crisis. With a trillion dollars in deficits put upon us in the last two years, this year and next year projected, with our nation spread like we were in the Vietnam era around the world in a battle we're not sure why we were there in the first place. Some believe it, some think it's good, some think it's bad, a decision that history will only make. With those around this world who like us and some who don't like us, and here at home when we have this divide where we can't pay for good schools and good systems, sewage systems, good water systems and health care and drugs and you name it, when a person goes to jail and spends long, hard time for small crimes and drug abuses, and the leaders of Enron hardly ever get indicted, if they do, they get a little slap on the wrist. These divisions that separate us and seriously cause problems, we're going to solve these problems, I feel confident, because of people like you and what you're striving for, starting this annual forum on acceptance and diversity and tolerance. I remember some of the dark days that we've had in the past. I remember 1963. I was only three years out of law school. Dr. Martin Luther King was 10 days out of the Birmingham jail when a group of Klansmen put dynamite in a stairwell of the 16th Street Baptist Church not far from here, over in Alabama. Four little Sunday school girls died there because of the color of their skin. And I know Dr. King must have had a heavy heart when he attended their memorial service. 
trying to explain the inexplicable. But you know, in 1963, when he was no national hero, he was looked at as some type communist troublemaker. His telephone was being tapped by law enforcement at the time. There'd been no Martin Luther King holiday. That was many years to come. People wouldn't even have dreamed of that at that time when America was facing those dark days. There'd been no 60, 1964 Civil Rights Act or 1965 Voting Rights Act. That was yet to come. But in 1963, facing that horrible, dark tragedy when those four little Sunday school girls died, Dr. King told us something very important. He said, I believe in you. He said, I believe in this nation. I believe we're going to overcome these problems. He went to Washington, D.C. with 250,000 people at his feet and millions watching on television when he said that he had faith in those of us who existed today, today and at that day and you that would come in the future. He said that I have a dream that one day in the red clay hills of this state, Georgia, that the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would sit down around the table of brotherhood. Well, a lot's happened in the more than 30 years since Dr. King left us. We've taken three steps back and two steps forward. We gain some here and we lose some here. I doubt if Dr. King would recognize the landscape if he was here today. The issues are so different. But I still think he would have his same spiritual faith, but I think he would have his faith in us as people, as Americans. And if he was making that same speech today, if I might be so bold to put words in this great man's mouth, he might say that I have a dream that one day in the red clay hills of Georgia, and today he might add, in the barrios, on the reservations, in the ghettos, and in the seats of economic and political power in this nation, that the sons and daughters of former slaves and the sons and daughters of former slave owners, and today, he might add, the poor, the powerless, the homeless, and those who hold the keys to the economic and political power of this nation will sit down around the table of personhood and truly learn to love one another. When Dr. King was with us, he told us an old story, an old story about another nation at another time, a nation that no longer existed, a nation that had strayed from its ideals like he felt that our nation was straying from our ideals because we treated millions of our citizens much less than second class. And I think he told us this old story as a reminder. The year was 750 B.C. The Jews, the children of Israel, after being held as slaves in Egypt, wandered from place to place, receiving awful treatment, seeking a home. And they finally built a great city called a city-state back then, near the present site of Jerusalem. In this great city, with high walls surrounding it, those on the inside who prospered got nice building lots and built beautiful homes overlooking fertile valleys. They had a law enforcement system, an education system, a banking system, very much like today. And that was a giant marketplace in the center of this great city where people from far and wide outside of the walls bought their products in to sell. And there was one farmer who came through these gates early in the morning with his wagon laden, and he saw things that bothered him. He saw able-bodied men and women with their arms outstretched begging for a few grains from his wagon. And upon inquiry, he learned that if you didn't belong to the right group, 
You didn't get a good job or a job at all to feed your family. And when he went into the marketplace, he heard people coming by his stall and he heard them grumbling. He learned that they weren't happy with the court system and the law enforcement and other things because the justice you got it often depended on the group you was a part of or how much money you might have. And this, this bothered this farmer because he knew the trials and tribulations that these people had come through and he wanted them to be successful. He was a man of some means and reputation and he wanted the opportunity to come before the leaders of this town and give him his opinion. And they granted him that opportunity. I'm sure many of you know this farmer. He was a biblical prophet, Amos. And Amos stood before these people and he said, Folks, you know, you have a good thing going here. But unless you are fair to all the people, unless you take care of the least among you, then you're not going to be able to keep the good things you have and pass down to future generations. Unless you are fair, then what you have will be taken away from you. And I predict, Amos said, there won't be a stone left upon a stone of this great city. And he spoke to them the words that Dr. King spoke so often to us at a dark day in our history. Amos said, don't be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters. I'm sure that the great prophets of other religions probably said about the same thing. Do unto others. Recently, a friend attended about six viewings of the Passion of the Christ. This great prophet Jesus came along after Amos, but he probably still believed in the same things. And this friend told me as he watched this, the people watched the film, and that's why this man went. He was a sociologist. He watched the people watch the film, and he saw them weeping and crying unbelievably because either the pain they felt for this man being tortured or the pain they felt for themselves for not living up to his ideals. And then he said he followed many of them out into the parking lot and saw numerous get in cars with bumper stickers like I support the NRA, the National Rifle Association, or down with gays, and you name it. And he told me something that was really telling. As these people walked out of the confines of that theater, or maybe the confines of their church, they failed to remember that it was the prophet Jesus or the prophet Amos who also had a passion. But that passion was for the poor, the sick, the homeless, people who were different, people who were despised. I don't know what your religion is and what you believe, but if you just read in the Bible, they attribute to Jesus. There was this lady who came to the well to get some water. And all these religious people saying, she can't drink out of this well. She's a Samaritan or something or another. I don't remember my stuff that well years ago. And he said, look, look, this water in this well is the water of life. And it's for everybody. That's the passion. That's the real lesson. And I just hope that those people who are spending now up to $250 million to see this movie will take some of that real passion out into our community where there are people who are suffering, who need help. I feel that we're going to overcome these problems that threaten us. And I'm not promoting or pushing any religious belief at all. But the same lesson that Dr. King was talking about is the lesson that affects us today. 
and that is that we not be satisfied just to learn our lessons in school, the things that we hope that will make us a living, but that we won't be satisfied truly until justice does roll down like waters, and that's your challenge. And I predict that you're going to do that. And I predict that one day when myself and a lot of the older people in here won't be around, that somebody will buy, write a book about your times and your contributions and your nation. In fact, it might be one of you who will write that book many years from now. And I predict that it will be a book about America's greatest generation. Thank you so much. We have time for questions, and uh, I'll just, you know, you can probably just stand up where you are if you have a question. I'll be glad to try to answer it. Don't be bashful. Usually when I get through speaking, people come up later and say, gosh, I had this question. I wish I had answered it. Ask it. Maybe I can't answer it, but I'll give a shot. Thank you. You don't feel, don't, don't feel like you have to come down front either because I've got some people help here that we can, we can figure it out, and especially because I can't hear very good at all. Well, I, I'll try to ask the question so everyone can hear me. I'll repeat the questions, by the way. Okay. Uh, I was just curious about the Vietnamese fishermen that you, that you had helped. You had given them legal protection, and they were able to continue. Uh, but how, was the, how did the community react to them after that? Have, have they been able, are they been accepted by the, the greater community in Galveston, or are they still in, in fear? And the question was, after we helped the Vietnamese fishermen, how did the community react? Did it support the people, the fishermen, the Vietnamese, or not? Going into the case, we found little support for the Vietnamese fishermen, especially the editorials in the newspaper, the television. Only one television station reported very much favorable about it because the rumor was that these people got to this country and immediately went on food stamps and immediately started taking advantage of our government. Secondly, the rumor was that they broke the fishing laws. They cut through other people's nets and lines and, and violated the rules. And thirdly, they broke the fishing laws because they brought undersized shrimp in and this, that, and the other. Well, we didn't have to disprove any of that in court. It wasn't necessary. All we had to prove that they would be in arrest and their right to fish would be violated. But because I was so uh, taken by these people in their dedication, I decided to debunk each one of those things in court for the news media so it would be reported. Because I was so proud to represent these people because I found that the young woman who graduated from Kemer High School, the valedictorian, the year I went down to help him with the case, was Vietnamese. And she came to this country in the ninth grade speaking not one word of English. Let me tell you, she got my attention. So we got the fish and game officials to get on the stand and testify that no, the Vietnamese had fewer violations of the fishing laws than the American fishermen. We got the Department of Health and Human Services to say that the Vietnamese, no, they didn't get food stamps, no. Two and three families moved into one house, they pooled their resources. In fact, many of them didn't want food stamps because of the pride they felt in being able to come to this country. So they worked two and three jobs. No, they didn't do this. And we also proved that they didn't take advantage of our government in any way. Well, after that happened, the, I think the whole public perception began to change. One woman testified, a white woman, that she had been threatened that a house would be burned if the Vietnamese allowed to, to, allowed to keep her boats in her dock down in Kemer, Texas. And she was very brave to come testify. She didn't want to. It took me a long time to convince her, and she came with her priest holding on to her arms because she was so afraid the clam was going to burn. But when she testified, her story was reported in the newspaper, 
And she got an enormous amount of you know, praise for her courage. So I guess the lesson here is, to me, is that when those people help these Vietnamese by standing up for what was right, then our American spirit kicked in. And that is, we like to help the underdog in this country. I know sometimes I have no interest in either basketball team or either football team until I find out who's the underdog. Then I'm pulling for that one, unless it's Auburn. <laughs> I wouldn't pull for Auburn for anything. Um, I'm, I'm for Alabama. Well, anyway, that's my prejudice. Any other questions? Yeah, let me try to clear that up because it involves an issue that's a bigger issue than the Sierra Club. Sierra Club has 750,000 members, a budget of close to $90 million, and you know they're involved in environmental issues, protecting the water and the air, mountains, streams, drilling in refuges, etc. But the, the faces of hate are taking different forms today. They're trying to infiltrate and take over major groups because of the prestige of the groups. There are a number of people who want to be, get on the Sierra Club board so they can control it. They say, I don't know how many board members, let's say there's 15 and there's about three or four that believe that the Sierra Club ought to come out against immigration in America. No more immigration. Because they say that that uh, will really hurt our environment to have too many people here. Well, I don't know the pros and cons of that issue. It probably is not as significant, especially with the open space as we have and compare countries that are much more popular, but that's a different issue. But it seems that those who are backing those board members are members of hate groups, neo-Nazi groups, other groups. Not that the board members, I won't say that they personally are racist, but they're being promoted by those, and if you look on the websites of a large number of hate groups, they're urging their members to join the Sierra Club, send their $15 in, and every member gets to vote. My name was put up there at a time when this was not an issue of very much attention. They thought because of the prestige of the work at the Law Center, in fact, we had actually uncovered, uncovered this uh, plot by these groups to take over the Sierra Club, that maybe our being involved would call attention. Well, it happened. It's been on every news media, front page of the New York Times, editorial in the New York Times, CNN, everybody. And there's a, there are a slate of delegates put up by the Board of Directors that uh, are not in favor of this, Im this immigration plank, which is alien to the Sierra Club. And also, 12 or 14 past presidents have come out for the slate put up by the administration, so to speak. So that's what that issue involves. But the case that I'm working on right now is a case, again, down in Texas. And I'll try it August 18th with other lawyers. And the case involves a vigilante hate group posing as protector of ranchers' land. They call them ranch rescue. And this group, this group uh, uh, dresses in paramilitary clothes. They have trained attack dogs. They have all these military hardware, I mean, it's like, a, like an army, and they go to ranches, they say, look, let us protect your property from these people coming across the border from Mexico and El Salvador, et cetera. Well, they're really not interested in the ranchers' property anymore than these people are interested in Sierra Club's policy. They simply want to beat up on these people. They're xenophobic. They believe that this is their America and these people shouldn't be here, even though every time they come here, they find jobs waiting I think I've been told that the construction industry in Atlanta probably would collapse if you didn't have Latino workers, and you could probably name many others. The chickens you get at Kentucky Fried, etc., those chickens are picked and processed by people who probably are not from this country recently. This is the case all over America. Well, my two clients are Salvadorians who cross the border and then 
were driven some 60 miles and crossed through a ranch that this particular man was at a particular mean spirit, and he had these people there, and they were beaten severely. Uh, pistol whip, attacked by a Rottweiler dog, and we sued the rancher because he knew these people were going to be violent. He had witnessed them beat up an, another Mexican at another time, yet he let them stay on his property. It would be like, you have the right to protect your property for sure from trespassers, and Walmart has the right to keep people from stealing the merchandise, but they can't get a paramilitary army out there, and when you, somebody steals a water hose and goes out the parking lot, they can't chase them down and riddle their car full of bullets from an AK-47. They can't do that. I mean, the price of the hose is that's not America's system. You can only use whatever force is necessary, not that kind of force. We think we'll have a good result in that case, and we'll take down this hate group operating out of Arizona called Ranch Rescue, run by a, former, by a guy who was actually associated with the Arizona militia group, one of those groups that Timothy McVeigh had a lot of association with. Yes, sir. You know, I, w I would just be absolutely satisfied that the states in America passed laws that allowed people of whatever sexual orientation or whatever relationships to go down there and say, I want to marry you and you want to marry me. It, I don't think that that threatens anything. Let me tell you, the people that oppose gay marriage, uh, you don't hear them say much about the thousands of children born from heterosexual marriages who don't have health care, dental care, good educations, decent housing, and decent clothes. That, to me, is a sanctity of marriage. Taking care of those children who are born and left alone. I don't know why it bothers people about other people's sexual orientation, but it would bother me that if the person, if my wife, went to the hospital for some injury, and I arrived at the emergency room, and they say, oh, you can't go in here because you're not a member of the family. That would really bother me, and probably bother you too. You know, and I think it can go on and on, whether it be handling property, etc. We have many, many gay friends, my wife and I, and they have very, very stable relationships that have lasted for many, many years, longer than many of my other friends, including myself because I've been married before, let me tell you, it, none of us have the answer to everything. I think it's a political issue. Uh, there, there's a law of sanctity, respect and sanctity of marriage on the federal books passed by Congress, but our current president decided he wanted to jump in on a constitutional amendment. I think that the founders of this country would be flipping around their graves if we knew that every time we had some political issue that divided us, we wanted to do a constitutional amendment. It's just, uh, it's just kind of sad that this country had gotten down to those when the real issues, and those are big issues in some people's mind, and you have certainly the right to disagree, but the real issues in this country have to do with health care, education, feeding our people, and providing fairness and justice. Those are core issues. These other issues, they're not core issues. And this nation is not going to crumble because we allow choice for women then this nation's not going to crumble because two people who care about each other stand up and say, yes, we're married. That's, our nation won't crumble from that. Our nation will crumble when we suppress people's rights. Okay. Got time for a few more questions here, and I think they've got a little video they want to show you. Mr. Dees. Yes. Um, my question is, um, if you remember back in the Oklahoma bombing, um, which I consider to be a terroristic attack. However, it seems that the, uh, the news media only portrayed September 11th as a terroristic attack um, on a national basis, and it's stereotyped it towards, when you think of terrorism, you think of Arab descent. However, my question to you is, do you feel that the news media needs to be more tolerant? Because their, their paradigms that they portray are also causing hate and causing people to single individuals out, which resulted in several people being attacked. Sure. For example, I remember one person who was wearing a turban was right. killed because they thought he was Arab. In actuality, he turned out to be Indian. Right. 
So um, how do you feel about that, sir? Well, first of all, when we say the news media, we're talking about a very, very large and broad group of people. Uh, there are networks that all the way from Fox Television, it's really the publicity arm for the Pentagon and Mr. Bush, all the way to, I shouldn't have said that, uh, <laughs> all the way to uh, public television and, and public radio that less than 3% of the American people listen to, but probably gives us a clearer, clearer picture of what's going on in the country. So the news media is everywhere. I do think that we are guilty, we as people and as the news media, of stereotyping. When Oklahoma City happened, I remember I was, in a, I was down in Florida taking a deposition in a case I represented some abortion clinics that had been bombed and a doctor had been shot and killed, first doctor killed in this whole thing. And I remember taking depositions and I walked out of the room, uh, bags in my hand, we just finished the depositions in the morning and got ready to pack my bags and they flipped the television on and it had just happened. Just, you know, everybody remembers where they were when you heard about Oklahoma or something like that. And immediately, I, one of our chief investigators was with me. We immediately, because we had the telephone number, called the criminal section of the Justice Department, civil rights section, and said, more than likely, this was done by a member of a militia group operating in the Midwest because we had picked up on some threats to bomb buildings and do things of this nature. Uh, and we told them this, I'm talking about five minutes after it happened, at least I think it was five or ten minutes. And yet FBI agents, maybe because of the stereotypes, started rounding up Arabs and they, 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 the, the suspect was because it's somewhere in Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, they'd had a convention earlier, some people from Arabic nations, and they started rounding them up and actually arrested a couple of people of Arab descent and put them in a jail. Fortunately, they caught Timothy McVeigh pretty quick. And he, obviously, you know, my opinion, he did it, and he did it with very few people. He had the smoking gun evidence with him. You know, he had a copy of a little book talking about the blowing up of a federal building, a fictional account of an overthrow. That was on the back seat of his car, and he had underlined the use of a truck bomb with ammonium nitrate and all that kind of stuff. So, but our nation quickly did this. Uh, I think of Oklahoma City as a terroristic attack, no question. Today, though, I understand that fewer people visit the site of its 165 or 70 people uh, because the World Trade Center raised the body count, put crudely, to over 3,000 or so people. So it changed the dynamics and the whole paradigm changed. And it was somebody coming in from outside. I don't think that we raided militia camps around the country like we took off after Afghanistan, and there were many people in these militia groups that certainly should have been rounded up and questioned like we did the Taliban, because they're just as dangerous. I think things change, you know, and up from those two instances, there's a very distinct difference in those two. Uh, when we had this war in, in, uh, recently in Iraq, and the reporters were, quote, embedded, as you probably saw, I watched everything that's going on. You know, God, I watched it so much that I probably should have been watching so much. I guess everybody did. Well, how much freedom does an embedded reporter who eats and sleeps with the troops have to tell about what's really going on? It's just very difficult. So, I mean, I think it's a clever move to have them there, but I'm not so sure that you get any more than just a live shot of a battle and very little commentary. The, uh, after the Vietnam War, the great books came out. The Bright and Shining Lie by Neil Sheehan, the reporter for the New York Times, who said, you know, we were lied to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a war that we should have never been in. I think very few people in America even disagree with that today. But back then, it was unpopular to be against the war, even though the war itself was unpopular. Today, it's unpopular to speak out against our war in Iraq, generally, because it looks like you're not being loyal to our troops. You can be loyal to our troops who are in Vietnam. Your family members may be there. You may have lost family members. But that doesn't mean that we should back a policy of our nation that's wrong-headed. So that, as I said, history will tell. You know, I'm not running for some political office, and you've got to make these decisions yourself. But the news media, as you point out, has a lot to do with shaping our opinion. Sometimes, in fact, this morning I got through exercising and I turned the television on 
I'd been watching it exercising, and all of a sudden I said something to myself in my head talk. I said, I think I'm getting more noise than news, you know, with 24 hours, da 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 da. So I got on uh, the animal channel and watched some little dog chase a ball around, <laughs> you know. We got time for one more question? Yes. Maybe two? Okay. Yes, ma'am, go ahead on. The question was, how does the Southern Poverty Law decide which cases to take? Uh, we, we really are, are not a legal aid group. We, there, we have legal services for that, Alabama Legal Services and others. We don't represent somebody who can't afford a lawyer because they're looking for a divorce. They got evicted from a house. We would more than like to take the case that would try to change the law that dealt with how you evict people from houses. We do class action, high impact litigation, uh, and a decision is usually made by the lawyers that work there. And so most of the time, people come to us. We're in Mississippi and Louisiana now working on their juvenile justice issues, and those are quite, uh, quite barbaric conditions for young people in Mississippi and Louisiana. And we were asked to get into both, both cases by lawyers in those states, juvenile projects. So we've worked on a lot of death penalty litigation over the years, sometimes asked by others. Um, I, for the last 20 years, have basically sued hate groups around America. Uh, in one place or another, from the Aryan nations of Idaho to the white Aryan resistance to Oregon to the Klan, right here in Forsyth County, Georgia, represented 1987 or 8, about 100 marchers who was beat up by the Klan, and that once was, there was no African American living in that county at the time, 1987. It's kind of strange sounding. But the Klan was trying to run the few out of there that had come to visit. So that's been my kind of litigation. Yes? Well, he said he thinks every high school should have a diversity course, and how can we make that happen? Um, well, school, bo school boards have a lot of fish to fry for their schools. And clearly from my talk, I think you understand, or at least I hope you understand, that I believe that reading and writing and arithmetic are important, but so is getting along with people is equally important. Uh, a lot of school boards don't deal with all these subjects. They, some people might say you need to have a lesson on health care and how to manage a checkbook and a whole lot of other subjects. Uh, I don't know that we're so much in favor of a course on diversity as we are a culture or climate in the school. We have 80,000 schools that use our education materials called teaching tolerance. And we say tolerance, we don't mean to tolerate as some people might think. We chose the name from the United Nations Declaration of Tolerance, and is defined there as accepting the differences among us and building on those differences for a greater world. But whatever the semantics, we, we have a magazine that goes to 600,000 teachers in this country called Teaching Tolerance. And in this magazine, teachers share ideas. We have videotapes and teachers' guides that schools are using, some 80,000 schools in the country. And we want a, like this college is having this program, to create a culture of diversity in the school, a culture of respect for differences. Now, whether you can do that with one course, it may or may not can. Sometimes these diversity days end up with them serving tacos in the lunchroom and Italian spaghetti and collard greens, and everybody sits around and says, oh, yes, that's what, that's what it is, I see. And we have, a pro we have a program called Mix It Up. Just think. It probably happens here that if you have a cafeteria here, you might, that if you go in the cafeteria, you're probably going to see students of one type sitting at a table, whether it be the jocks, the cheerleaders, maybe black students, students from one of your many 41, 141 countries, generally sitting together because people tend to stay in their comfort zones. Our Mix It Up program is being used in high schools and colleges around the country. Uh, on a given day, November 18th, we ask students to sit at a table different, a table chosen by their birthdays. In other words, class goes from the 10th grade down to the lunchroom. You walk in, friends usually sit with each other and have a lot of fun at lunch and talk. Well, this day they sit at a table based on their birthday. And we found out in a lot of anecdotal but not scientific proof, but that students meet people they'd never met before. And they make friends they'd never met before because they had never gotten out of that little comfort zone. 
And it's not that mix it up is going to solve everything, but it's the first step of getting the school administration, the teachers, and the students moving towards a, a, an all-inclusive environment in the school. You know, a, a zero-tolerance policy, so to speak, on intolerance. And that, that's, that's what we think is a, is a good solution. It'd be nice if you had a, a good course, and some do. They have clubs, they have tolerance clubs and other kind of clubs in schools. Uh, we hope one day to have some president declare a national mix-it-up day where the president goes and eats, in the, eats with the help in the kitchen or wherever. And I think we, that might be a possibility soon. And, I, and they, also that happens in corporations and happens in our communities around the country. We have something called 101 Tools for Tolerance. You can check our website, tolerance.org. Check that one because that leads you to everything. And you can download stuff like Mix It Up for your schools and classes. You can download our booklet, 101 Tools for Tolerance. These are things that you can do yourself that, uh, that will help in introduce your families and your friends and your nieces and nephews and others to uh, a diverse culture. Let me just answer one more question. If we have one, if we don't, we don't. You, somebody raise your hand back there. Yes. The question was, she, she says that she remembers reading an article where an African-American church opposed some issue, whether it be a gay issue or a Ten Commandments issue. Well, you know, in America, you, people have the right to disagree. And more recent, most recently, the White House pulled together 12 or 15 African-American church leaders who came out against gay marriage. Uh, also a hate group involved in the well, that, that could be. You know, it's hard to keep hate groups out of things. And, and that doesn't mean that the African-American church is a hate group because the hate group happens to appear at the same rally all, all in favor of opposing the Ten Commandments, whichever it might be. Uh, yeah, you may, there's a lot of diversity. In the African-American community, I understand, uh, you know, a, a community I'm only a part of, not by blood, but by hopefully an appreciation because I can't walk in other people's shoes. But I understand that there's a, you know, a, head is, a reticence to really deal forthrightly with the issues of, of, of gays and also lesbians and also AIDS. It's, it's, a, it's an issue and in the, in, there's a rising increase in the number of cases some people think because we, there's not a strong voice educating people. And that may or may not be true. I mean, I'm really not the one to say. But on this Ten Commandments issue, I happen to have been a lawyer that filed a lawsuit against the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court because he had a Ten Commandments monument, big, big as this right here, weighing a ton, and with an open book up on top of it with the Ten Commandments on it, and he moved it into our Supreme Court in the middle of the night without telling anyone, not even the other eight justices. And, uh, and so I represented some lawyers that filed a lawsuit against him, and we got it removed, and we got him removed because he refused to remove it, and you can't refuse to violate a court order. He said he, he could pick and choose which orders he wanted to violate, like George Wallace did. So the other eight members of our court kicked him off the court. He was tried by a judicial counsel and stripped of his job as chief justice, and he's got one appeal left, and I'm sure he'll lose it. Now, what about the Ten Commandments? What about that? We saw it as a serious issue of religious intolerance. I'm not against religion. You probably can tell of my conversation, my speech. No. The U.S. Supreme Court has the Ten Commandments in the U.S. Supreme Court. But there's quite a difference in having the Ten Commandments viewed as a, as a part of our judicial history. Because in the Supreme Court, there are, there's a big array of the great lawgivers. Moses with the Ten Commandments, and they're about this little on the thing. Hammurabi, the Code of Hammurabi, Justine, the Code of Justinian, Confucius. They even have uh, Arabic codes. All this went together to make up the law that we have. It didn't come from the Ten Commandments. The first five have nothing to do with laws. Thou shalt have no other God before you, unless you live in a 
totalitarian, you know, religious type country. But the first five have nothing to do whatsoever. And the second five, you shouldn't kill or steal. They've been a part of every law since people got six together, out, you know, and came down to make a little community somewhere. You can't have those things. And the history traces those back long before the Ten Commandments. Those are good ideas. And to say that you can't have the Ten Commandments like he did in the Alabama Supreme Court is not saying that you're against religion at all. Religion is free in this country. There are more churches probably than bars in Atlanta, Georgia, probably. And uh, <laughs> I know in some towns there are. And so we don't have any shortage of places to go pray, but we don't necessarily need to make this a government of a specific church is what it boils down to. And especially when you have 144 countries here and a, a great majority of them probably are not Judeo-Christian. So anyway, but thank you so much. We city of Carlson, one of every three the city of Carlson, one of every three residents was not born in the United States. Consequently, this is only a consequence. Consequently, this is only a reflection of the county where our college is located. In three hundred and county has seen a three hundred percent increase in the refugee or immigrant population in the past three years. With these statistics, fortunes and treasure all around us, fortunately, the treasure all around us is often With taken for granted. That this part the wealth of our city. That is a clear in campus often seems insignificant. In the global community that we call metropolitan, in the global community that we call metropolitan it is not Atlanta, a conflict arises that we do not consider the rise that we have seriously considered the impact of diversity. Instead, the best and beauty.